Hi guys, welcome back to this channel. I'm Teacher Sam, your online learning buddy. In my last video, we have learned that the overall plan or program of your research is known as a research design. We have discussed already the steps on how to write the chapter 3 of your research project. We are done discussing steps 1 and 2. So in this video, we will discuss steps 3 and 4. Step 3. Discuss the research environment. This section briefly covers the study's location as well as the rationale behind its selection, detailed information about the basis for the study's location selection, including relevant issues, concerns, and problems, are provided. Other institutions may require a map that shows the exact location in relation to the community and nearby towns. Step 4. Identify your population and sampling techniques. Your research design should specify who or what your study will focus on, as well as how you will select your participants or subjects. A population is the total group about whom you wish to make conclusions in research, but a sample is the smaller group of people from whom you will actually gather data. Plants, animals, organizations, text, countries, and other objects can all be included in a population. It usually refers to a group of persons in the social sciences. For example, will you target individuals from a specific demographic region or background? Are you looking for people who have a specific career or medical condition or users of a specific product? According to McCombs in 2021, the easier it is to collect a representative sample, the more precisely you describe your population. If you are studying the effectiveness of modular learning in the Philippines, it would be very difficult to get a sample that's representative of all high school students in the country. You might reduce the scope of the study to make it more manageable and derive more accurate conclusions. For example, grade 10 students in the Pitan City Public High Schools. Now let's discuss sampling procedure. Even with a narrowly defined population, collecting data from every individual is difficult. Instead, you will gather information from a sample. There are two basic methods for selecting a sample, probability sampling and non-probability sampling. The sample method you select has an impact on how confidently you can generalize your findings to the entire population. The researcher can use a variety of sampling techniques to choose the sample group or groups for the study. Let's discuss first probability sampling. Researchers can use probability sampling to create a sample that is representative of the real-life population of interest. A sampling method must use some form of random selection to be considered probability sampling. To put it another way, researchers must devise a method or procedure that ensures that the various units in their sampled population have equal chances of being chosen. For example, if a researcher is dealing with a population of 100 people, has a 1 in 100 chance of being chosen. Chosen. This is in contrast to non-probability sampling in which each member of the population has a different chance of being chosen. Simple random sampling. In this technique, individuals are chosen in such a way that each has an equal chance of being chosen for the study. Steps to conduct simple random sampling. Make a list. Assign a sequential number. Choose sample size and use random number generator. An example of simple random sampling would be the names of 25 employees being chosen out of a hat from a company of 250 employees. In this case, the population is all 250 employees and the sample is random because each employee has an equal chance of being chosen. The example in which the names of 25 employees out of 250 are chosen out of a hat is an example of the lottery method at work. Each of the 250 employees would be assigned a number between 1 and 250, after which 25 of those numbers would be chosen at random. Systematic sampling. In this technique, every nth name is selected from a complete list containing the names of all members of the defined population from which inferences are to be made. For example, if you wanted to select a random group of 1,000 people from a population of 50,000 people
example using systematic sampling, you would need to compile a list of all potential respondents and choose a beginning point. Following the formation of the list, every 50th individual on the list, counting from the designated starting point, would be picked as a respondent because 50,000 divided by 1,000 equals 50. If the beginning point was 20, for example, the 70th person on the list would be chosen, then the 120th, and so on. If more respondents are needed after reaching the end of the list, the count loops back to the beginning to complete the count. Stratified random sampling. In this technique, the sample is selected according to the proportion found in the identified subgroups of the defined population to get a representative sample. The following is an example of stratified random sampling. Next, we have cluster sampling. In this technique, the sample is selected according to the proportion found in the identified subgroup. In other words, selection through simple random sampling is made of the whole group, not of individuals. Researchers use the sampling technique to examine a sample that includes numerous sample criteria such as demographics, habits, background, or any other population trait that is relevant to the research being undertaken. When groups that are similar yet internally heterogeneous constitute a statistical population, this technique is generally used. Cluster sampling helps researchers to acquire data by bifurcating the data into tiny, more productive groups rather than picking the total population. For example, a researcher wants to conduct a study to determine the performance of first-year college students in English in Mindanao. It is impossible to conduct a research study that involves a student in every university. Instead, by using cluster sampling, the researcher can club the universities from each city into one cluster. These clusters then define all the first-year college student population in Mindanao. Next, either using simple random sampling or systematic random sampling, randomly pick clusters for the research study. Subsequently, by using simple or systematic sampling, the first-year college students from each of these selected clusters can be chosen on whom to conduct the research study. Non-probability sampling. It is defined as a sampling technique in which samples are chosen based on the researcher's subjective judgment rather than random selection. It's a more lenient approach. The researcher's expertise is heavily reliant on the sampling technique. It is carried out through observation and it is widely used in qualitative research. In non-probability sampling, every person in the population has an equal chance of being chosen. For exploratory studies, such as a pilot survey, non-probability sampling is ideal. Researchers use this method in studies where random probability sampling is impossible due to time or cost constraints. These are the types of non-probability sampling. 1. Convenience sampling. It is a non-probability sampling technique in which samples are chosen from the population solely on the basis of their accessibility to the researcher. The researchers chose these samples solely because they are easy to recruit and they did not consider selecting a sample that is representative of the entire population. In research, it is ideal to test a sample that is representative of the population. However, the population in some studies is too large to examine and consider the entire population because of its speed, cost effectiveness, and ease of availability. Convenient sampling is one of the reasons why researchers rely on it. Another non-probability sampling technique is consecutive sampling. With a few exceptions, this non-probability sampling technique is very similar to convenience sampling. The researcher selects a single person or a group of people from a sample, conducts research over a period of time, analyzes the findings, and then moves on to a different subject or group if necessary. The consecutive sampling technique allows the researcher to work on a variety of topics and fine-tune his or her research by collecting data that provides important insights. Then we have quota sampling. Let us assume that a researcher wants to investigate the career goals of male and female employees in a company. The organization has 500 employees, also known as the population. The researcher will only 
only need a sample of the population, not the entire population, to gain a better understanding of it. Furthermore, the researcher is interested in specific population strata. This is where quota sampling comes in handy for stratifying or grouping the population. Then we have purposive sampling. Purposive sampling, also known as judgmental, selective, or subjective sampling, is a non-probability sampling technique in which researchers choose members of the public to participate in their service based on their own judgment. For service performed utilizing online survey platforms, this service sampling strategy requires researchers to have previous knowledge of the goal of their study in order to correctly pick and approach eligible participants. Purposive sampling is used by researchers to gain access to a certain subset of people as all survey participants are chosen because they meet a specific profile. The judgmental sampling technique involves researchers selecting samples solely based on their own knowledge and credibility. In other words, researchers select only those individuals who they believe are suitable for participation in the study. Judgmental or purposive sampling is not a scientific method of sampling and the disadvantage is that the results can be influenced by the researchers' preconceived notions. As a result, there is a lot of ambiguity in this research method. Snowball sampling. Snowball sampling aids researchers in locating samples that are difficult to find. When the sample size is small and not readily available, researchers use this technique. This sampling system functions similarly to a referral program. Once the researchers have found suitable subjects, he asks for their help in finding similar subjects so that a sufficiently large sample can be formed. The following is an example of a quasi-experimental research indicating the research respondents. The following is an example of a correlational research presenting the respondents of the study. The first two exemplars are examples of quantitative research design. For qualitative research design, the following is an example. There you have it, e-learners. I hope you learned something from this video. If you are new in this channel, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell para update ka sa mga upcoming videos. See you in my next video. Happy learning!